welcome back to our crafting playthrough world, Zero Gravitas here. In our previous episode, we looked at how hover pads can now vector to produce propulsion and turning forces. We saw how this could produce some problems, and then we built some improved hover racers using only the parts sold to us by Hubble and some basic GSO blocks. In this episode, we're going to continue straight on from there, but we're going to be looking at some more radical and interesting designs. And to introduce the ideas we need to understand these, we're going to first look at why we didn't use skids on the front of our simple hover bike. Now, what is happening with that? Well, hell now, fellow Terratechies, this is what we call the hover bug. Each time the foot of the skid deploys, it's triggering the hover ring directly above it, which thinks that the skid is the ground and pushes off very hard, tipping the tech back. I think this is a good point to do a quick primer in R&D mode on how the hover bug works. Hover bug builds typically sit wheel blocks directly in front of hover plates. One of the most popular wheel blocks to use is the GSO hub wheel because it has lots of attach points and it's small and easy to fit into any build. The tire on a wheel moves independently from the rest of the tech's grid, so it has its own collider, and hopper plates seem to identify this incorrectly as being the ground. So, as well as constantly pushing, a hover bug will keep the tech in the grounded state. This means that you can use the build beam in mid-air, and you can also anchor down regardless of how high you are. This game glitch was first reported on the official forums by a user called Dmind, way back in December 2015. They were very quick to point out and demonstrate creative uses for this bug. Because of these, the game's developers, Payload Studios, have very deliberately left it in as a feature, although they have recently been trying to replace its functionality with more legitimate means. We'll come back to this demo build in a minute. If we load Dmine snapshots from almost three and a half years ago, we can see that they work almost the same. Although, of course, changes to wheels and buffs to hover plates and adjustment thrusters have thrown the balance off somewhat. This build uses little trekker wheels which overlap the plates from the side. This is fine, but a single wheel may move off the plate as the angle of the tech changes. The hover bug has been used for a range of things other than flight. For example, a couple of contributors to my great ball contraption collaborative build used it to power rotating armatures as part of multi tech designs like this centrifuge by Mr. Twister with large hover plates buried in the arms, and this ball serving machine by GKJ. Other mechanisms, like this crane by Quackduck, exploit the fact that resource chunks also trigger hover plates, so conveyors with carefully spaced resources can be used to program automatically turning the force on and off over time, with the plates hidden inside this crane for example pushing it one way and then the other in turn. For a while, other collidable objects including the outside of shield bubbles and laser projectiles also triggered the hover bug, but that was patched out. Anyway, before the release of Better Future, the hover bug would only provide a fixed amount of force in a single direction. This meant that, although it could be used for lifting airships, it had to be very carefully balanced against the weight, and fans or propellers were needed to provide movement, as with this design by Quackduck. Of course, when the original was built, there was no way to straight or to use the same fans for lift up and down. So this design has enjoyed significant functional improvements after some minimal redesigns for balance. However, now we have hover force vectoring, which has been applied retroactively to all hover pads. We can use the hover bug itself to control movement in the air. Let's have a look at how that works on our little demonstration build. Generally what you'll want to do is sandwich a wheel between two opposed hover plates. This means that their forces will cancel out when there's no control inputs. And we've just turned the hub wheel sideways to ensure that the tyre itself is exactly halfway between the two. See how the lift is almost perfectly balanced now? Oh yes, we'll just have to switch from car to hovercraft for lift and strafe controls. And there we go. Now we can actually see the hover pads tilting to push us sideways. If we think about the components of the vectored forces, we can see why this is working. The vertical aspects are opposed and cancel out to zero, but the horizontal components are pushing the same way and reinforce. So we can move around in the horizontal plane of the hover plates by accelerating forwards and back or strafing side to side, and lift will scale the power of the plates for vertical control up and down, increasing the power of one while decreasing the power of the other respectively. Now, we can't control rotation with a single pair of hover pads, let alone pitch and tilt. But you certainly can if you have an array of hover pad pairs in every axis. Like this slightly over the top concept design by forum user Legionite, which he came up with during the brief canary testing period just before release of the first Better Future Unstable update. 
As we can see demonstrated, it's able to do translational movement in all three linear planes, as well as tip in all three rotational planes, and pretty much hold altitude in any pose, even without charging it to power the anti-gravity, which really would let it stay perfectly fixed in space. As we can see, this system lets us move through space pretty much however we like, doing some really weird manoeuvres. So, by using the vectored hover bug in this way, you can fly without fans, rotors or anti-grav, and you can easily hide the setup inside for some very clean looking airship builds. Like this very sleek looking workshop tech by GK Beck, which looks somewhere between a spaceship and a submarine. It's perfectly balanced in the air, and is deceptively fast and responsive for such a big heavy tech. If we rip it open to take a quick look inside, we can see that they've used large GSO hover plates activated by tank tracks and GSO caterpillar tracks. And we can even see each of the little pads animating as they push us around. And I suppose it would be a bit mean to load such a beast of a tech and not fire a single cruise missile. So let's give the old brick a bit of a taste of our firepower. Ouch, that's pretty devastating looks like it's gonna pretty much two-shot it. Nice. Anyway, back to campaign now, and time for a little thought experiment. The terrain for this race was a little bit challenging, but what if we'd gone one trading station further over, and instead we picked up a race in properly gnarly mountains, like this? Let's see first how our improved but basic hover racer would deal with this. Even with a stabilizing computer, it's already sliding sideways. I'm not sure why we didn't stick a power gauge on earlier, so there we go. Okay, that'll do. And we're already struggling just trying to get down to the starting line. Again, we could probably struggle our way to victory here, with a couple of practice runs and a little luck. Basic copper techs will actually climb vertical cliffs pretty easily head on but negotiating and turning on sideways slopes is a real problem. Ooh, careful, don't slide off. That was close. Oops, should have dipped there. Easy. We're on a roll now. Oops, spoke too soon, clipped the ring. Oh no, the slopes launched us sideways. And back to the start we go. But first, we're going to see if any hover bug designs can help us get around more easily. Using only the four hover rings we bought earlier, we can build a stable hover bug core like this. Two pairs of opposed pads with hub wheels in the middle, a couple of gyros to maintain pitch, and some power blocks for protection. Like our little demo model earlier, we have vertical mobility, but much faster horizontal movement using the better future hover rings. In fact, the movement is a bit too fast when it comes to rotation it's kind of uncontrollable. Now, we could probably tame this using tail rudders and better future passive gyros when we get one. But the controls are still kind of jerky and as we can see here, we have to continually tweak our height manually using shift and control to avoid slamming into walls like this. All things considered, this basic design really isn't very fun or helpful. Let's just see if we can get our box back to safety now. If we can even get this thing to point in the right direction. And there we go, finally. And just the last little bit now. Yeah, no, no, yep. Yeah. Oh, we're getting the wrong one, I'll give up. This really is a handful. Thankfully, we have some more refined designs, which are a kind of hybrid between hoverbug and regular hover techs. This version has only one hoverbug pair of plates, which are centrally located to avoid producing much turning force. As you can see, it's a lot more controlled. In fact, I had to add a couple of adjustment thrusters to help turning on this model. And there you can see the two hub wheels hidden inside. Even with just the one hover bug pair, we can still lift straight up. Although it did take some trial and error to get the weight distribution just right. Here we can see how the downward facing hover rings help us follow the contours of the terrain. Well, to an extent. It's still worth holding shift to bring the nose up steep slopes. But this design is a lot more fun to drive over rough terrain. And if you take it slowly, it will ascend cliffs just as well as a regular hover, but with way more lateral stability. Whoops, there's no way to design around driver incompetence. 
Hmm, our batteries are getting a bit low. We'd better nip back to our improvised charging station. Ooh, evasive maneuvers. Get us out of here, Mr. Sulu. I really love the way this hugs the ground. But if you wanted a bit more of a safety buffer, you can increase the ride height by using a hover power controller block, which can drop from level 1 better future reward crates or mission enemies. Sorry, what was that? Anyway, the hover bug on this tech gives us so much traction that the stabilizing computer really has no trouble holding us perfectly still, even on a fairly steep hill. In fact, we can pretty much park in mid-air, and the horizontal hover bug plates alone will cause us to descend very slowly. So this tech should be pretty capable of completing the later anti-gravity missions too, let alone all adventures, flying and stunt missions. Now, I made this tech slant slightly forwards because I thought it looked cool, but you could raise up the rear hover ring like this, so that it's level with the front ring. Which brings us neatly to our second hybrid hover bug racer design. And yes, I know, I'm rattling for a whole lot of designs here again. When I started making the previous episode, I honestly just set out to show a souped up version of the hoverbird starter tech, and I didn't expect to find so many distinct variations of vectored hover bug configuration, just using the four hover rings provided. Anyway, as you can see, this version uses hover bug in a vertical plane. We've anchored down because we can't use a stabilizing computer with this design, and I'll show you why later. But the location of the hoverbug pair gives us nice turning without the need for adjustment thrusters. I kind of think they look prettier on the side too, and this means we can even stick a disc laser on the top. Despite the disadvantages, I kind of prefer the feel of driving this tech. And the vertically aligned hoverbug seems to provide slightly less resistance against nosing up. Despite having no additional fuel tanks, these little GSO thrusters can give us quite a long spurt of speed. Again the hoverbug lets us fly straight up and it also points the nose up or down depending which way we're going. It's kind of amusing, in profile this tech reminds me of the Planet Express ship from Futurama. This would make a really fun general runabout craft, with the speed and acceleration of the hoverbug combined with the automatic terrain avoidance of the regular hover plates, and you could easily add a couple of your favourite missiles for a bit of light combat. Anyway, the reason we can't use a stabilising computer with this configuration is that it seems to have a bit of a blind spot for vertically aligned hover pads. It causes them to push upwards continually even when there's no user input. And then here we can see, as a tech falls out the sky, that the hover bug provides very little resistance to movement in the same plane as the hover pads themselves. And again, I thought these would make pretty good designs to finish on, but then I figured out that there were some even more ludicrous possibilities. If we turn the first hover bug core we looked at earlier sideways, then the wheels or skids that trigger the hover bug plates can also perform their intended function of contacting the ground. Again we have full 3D movement. Of course there's no altitude hold and we can't use a stabilizing computer, but turning is naturally damped with the sideways hover plates. To be honest, wheels would probably have been a better choice here, they don't take a second or two to deploy for a start. But I kind of like the novelty of using these parts from the hoverbird tech. If you were to ditch the repair bubble, you could make this unlikely looking racer purely from those parts. Removing the heavy GSO batteries probably would give a more stable weight distribution, but this is not the most dignified of designs and it definitely will take a few knocks as it's scraping its way around a racetrack. This run has been pretty plain sailing so far actually, but we're getting to the trickier bit at the end. This tech tends to leap uncontrollably into the air, so we're just going to barge our way through there and then take our time picking our way across this horrible corner slope. Okay, steady, plenty of time, and fail. Right, back it up, ooh. Nope, try again. There, yeah, easy. We're on the home straight now. And we're finished. Well, that wasn't exactly record time, and it wasn't exactly dignified either, but then this wasn't our best craft. And we seem to have won a bunch of wheels. Anyway, we're going to load the final tech of the episode, which uses blocks from a couple of other corporations which we picked up earlier in the playthrough, and you might recognise it from the video's thumbnail. This little bike really does look, feel, and even sound like something from one of the Tron movies. It uses the Hawkeye straight bike wheels because they stick out all the way to the front, whilst only taking up two blocks worth of space between the hover plates. And just a single better future gyroscope for stability. Admittedly the hover rings and batteries do scrape on the ground a little bit and make a bit of noise, but the whole tech is so light that they barely take any damage, and of course this tech can just fly over terrain if you want to instead. Once powered up the venture repair bubble will fix any collision damage almost immediately, 
Both this and their little shield bubble have almost negligible passive power drain, so just the four batteries, which we're also using to hold on the hover rings, will be plenty enough to last ages in the field. The small ion drive in the back is the most important part of the build, because it gives us that all important glowing blue trail. But seriously now, the vectored hover bug is so strong that the ion drive only adds a few miles an hour to the top speed of this bike, which is about 165 miles an hour. And we can tap the pitch controls to do little backflips and other maneuvers while we're driving, or flying for that matter. This can even do genuine barrel rolls. But actually, you can't use a tech like this to do venture flight missions currently, because the hover bug grounds the tech as if you touch the floor. But you can still use it to ace the venture stunt and race missions. Oh, hang on a second. I was going to show a version with small, better future halo wheels. They offer a little bit less rolling resistance, and the whole thing's a bit lighter too, so this is really nippy around the track. I'm thinking it could be really fun to see these little Tron bikes raced competitively in co-op creative multiplayer. Wow, we really used the full width of the track there. Of course, you can retrofit your old designs with hover pads too, to give them a little bit of a speed boost and maybe some vertical mobility. Now, I've only shown single track vehicles here, like these bikes which lean incorrectly, which I'm planning to show in a future episode. But obviously you could upgrade cars or tanks too. And this little chap here is the fastest design that I could come up with using the small Better Future hover rings. It will go at 204 miles an hour flat out, but it's totally stripped down for speed. Now here's a preview of a larger Better Future bike which I'm yet to publish. The smaller rings give only a modest performance improvement here, making it a little bit nippier and maybe a bit more hold on turning. So instead of fully flipping the bike, the extra weight means that pitch back can be used to hold a wheelie, with careful control of acceleration of course. I've had only a limited play with these ideas, so there must be many more creative possibilities out there. Of course you can use these kind of designs to stay out of reach of enemies, but you could also use them to flirt with danger. And enemies upgraded with hybrid hover bug drives can also be faster and more challenging. I hope we've seen some fun ideas here for you to try out for yourselves. I'll be putting some of the text from this episode on the Steam Workshop of course, and also stick all of them in a zip file download linked from the description. Anyway, that's enough showing off for now. Back to campaign to finish up the episode. And as we're arriving back at base here, what did you guys think about my first time use of voiceover? To be honest, I'm not sure it ended up all that much quicker than writing captions in the end. But of course, if you enjoyed this video, likes, shares, comments, helps out me, helps out the channel, and most importantly lets me know that I really should not try to imitate Lathrix.